Welcome to HMG Live. How are we more responsible with our employees by making sure that we have created the most, you know, equitable and inclusive workforce and um, are taking, you know, actions, um, not just words, but actions to ensure that we have um, a, a workplace where employees can do the work of their lives? It is time. Uh, to look at this thoughtfully and really seize on the opportunities that it provides us. This is an opportunity to change the way we work, to change the way we collaborate, to change the culture of the whole workforce in the United States. A lot of the decisions that you make may or may not be right at the end of the crisis, right? So you have to uh, be courageous enough to continue to make those decisions very quickly. The focus now is the fusion of human and technology and how do we how do we have organizations that are technology organizations but are, are, are human they're distinctly human this will be a time of innovation hmg live virtual summits are offered by hmg strategy your global partner helping you reinvent an innovative future of work a warm welcome to today's host lead principal and ceo of hmg strategy hunter muller Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Hunter Muller, lead principal of HMG Strategy. My team and I are delighted to be here. Welcome to the 2020 Philadelphia CIO Virtual Summit, reimagining the business and the future of work, what you need to know now. I think we'll all agree we've been through a once in a lifetime unprecedented uh, event on a global level, a global economic uh, uh, health and society level. And uh, we're here to share the stories of our Experiences as well as the future. What lies, what's, what you need to know now to plan for the future. This summit is powered by Zoom. Really appreciate your help. Larry, Larry Bilker. Larry has been a great friend and partner at the Philadelphia Sim chapter. Larry, welcome to the program and uh, appreciate your partnership over, over six years now, I think. Thank you, Hunter. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to be back here. Uh, glad, so glad we're continuing these, uh, these summits and from all of our members of, of Sim Philadelphia, uh, we thank you. And thank you for including us and having us uh, be your partner and continuing that partnership. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, Sim Philadelphia is a, the Society for Information Management. We're a 250 plus member group in Greater Philadelphia. Uh, we, um, I'm, I'm gonna, we're, we're a great networking group. We have all kinds of events during the course of a year when we're not in a pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, we pivoted a bit We've been doing virtual meetings every two weeks. Uh, CIO only meetings are once a month or more. Uh, and it's been an incredible leadership communications and uh, mentoring type period, not just like um, to people that are uh, uh, the CIOs, but to all of our direct reports and others during all these trying times. And especially with the transition to work from home and now uh, transitioning back to work in some cases, it's been just an unbelievable, unprecedented precedented, um, experience for all of us. I'm sure everyone can relate. And uh, looking forward to today's events and the, uh, the incredible schedule that uh, Hunter and team have put together at HMG Strategy. Thank you, Hunter. Excellent, Larry. Thanks so much. Really appreciate uh, your engagement. So first up is Gary Sorrentino. Gary's the global deputy CIO of Zoom. Gary's got an amazing background uh, with uh, an incredible global experience, uh, most recently at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, Gary, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. But, you know, it's, it's worth giving 30 seconds on that, that experience at, at J.P. Morgan Chase because it really sets the global context of the kind of work you were doing for uh, Jamie Dimon. Do you want to just give uh, 30 seconds on that? Yeah, so I, yes, I did about 25 years in, in um, financial services, and I did that across four banks. So I, just to put the background, I did UBS, Credit Suisse, Citigroup, all small banks, and then I went to J.P. Morgan. And part of my life with J.P. Morgan was a, a CTO for Asset Wealth Management. But towards the end, I developed a program called Protect the Client. And it was really about J.P. Morgan giving back to their clients to make them cyber safe from the outside of the bank looking in. The bank was safe on the inside, but how do we get out, actually work with our clients and figure out how to make them safe? And so for the last four years, I had the honor of seeing uh, some of their most prestigious clients all over the world. And you now head up the CISO Council for Zoom, correct? I'm, I'm besides being the, uh, the deputy CIO, the global deputy CIO, I head up the, the Zoom uh, CISO Council, which is made up of about 
35 CISOs from some of the most prestigious companies in the world across 10 verticals. And they work with Zoom as voice of the client. Awesome. Love it. So, you know, you think about the workforce has gone under, has undergone amazing transformation and change over the past 120 days. What are the important steps for business leaders to succeed today in this journey, Gary? So let's break it down to maybe they need to talk about three things. They need to talk about or think about taking lessons learned from the crisis into the future, never give up a good chaos. Um, and part of that is about adapting to the new work life challenges that the employees are facing. Um, they need to consider what that new work life balance is going to look like. But I really think that people need to be cognizant of the problems we're having from work from home now, kids, families, personal time, bad internet is going to continue. So it's taking all those lessons into the future. Let's not discount what we learned. I think the second thing is they're going to need to adapt to flexible work schedules. And you can already see some people are going back thinking, well, we're going to get back to a normal schedule. You see, workers don't need to work near that office anymore. They can work anywhere they want. And we really do need to reassess which jobs need to be performed in the office and which don't. The employees are going to do this for us. Uh, we've heard many, many stories, even through your uh, network and your events, where people go back to work just to find out they did the same thing they did at home. They're on 10 Zoom meetings at work all alone. Why did I have to drive in? Why did I have to risk my health? And within days, they've reverted back to fully remote. And I think the problem is this. We knew how to work when, well, what was it pre-COVID? About 3% of the people worked full-time from home. So when 97% of the people are working on-premise, we know how to work. When 100% of the people are working virtually, we know how to work. Yeah, we don't know how to work in the hybrid. And that's a real problem about, we don't understand the communication challenges. So I, that's why I think the third thing they need to think about is, is getting collaboration in the hybrid. Um, the employees aren't doing a good job about it. The, the managers aren't doing a good job about it. Middle management, you know, managing while walking around, they have to be re-upskilled. Right? How are they going to do that? I think those are the three things that they need to think about moving forward. Thanks, Gary. When you think about the workforce, both short and long term, uh, what, what, do you, what do you think it'll look like? Mm, so let's think about this next stage. I look at this as we're evolving, right? We have no idea what the next norm is. We talk to lots of people. We talk to the analysts. Everybody's given us data from February. And in February, we were all thinking something different than we were in June. And so everybody's experimenting now. I think video conferencing in the short and long term is going to keep us connected. So that's going to be a standard. Um, I think we're going to find that balance between work and personal life again. And we're struggling right now, but we need to find that balance because when that computer bings in the other room, our sensation is to go over there and just answer it. And I think that people are now figuring out that, that boundary. Um, yeah, kids and, kids and pets, it's summertime, people are home, distractions. We're going to have to filter that all into the short term. Because during this transition, those things are still going to be with us. Um, are we still going to be productive working from home? And that's the thing I think that we need to think about short term. We might figure it out long term, but short term, we have to get this phased approach. And so what I think we're going to see is a drop in productivity in the short term learning, and then an increase in productivity and collaboration, we will figure out the hybrid world. And I do think uh, travel restrictions are going to continue. It's, it's just so easy to be at different events. Look, you're doing several events this week and you've never left the office. And so um, we're going to see that continue probably till at least the end of the year. I know for Zoom, we're, we're grounded till the end of the year period. Um, I think the other, Ged? After you. I got one more thing. And I think the last thing here in the short and long term is we are going to see the advent of the personal office improve. We're, you're going to see more of those uh, personal collaboration spaces and things like that. I think people, I was on with a bunch of just regular end users working from home. They're reinvesting into their home office. They're buying products they wouldn't have bought before because this is no more about Sunday night doing email. This is about full-time work. You know, cultures matters and culture is important that we learned that uh, from Peter Drucker, the late Peter Drucker. When you think of culture and the work from home environment in the Zoom world, what, what's important? What do you what are your tips? Yeah, so we talked about culture and and there's 
we have to figure out how do we replace those in-person collisions, those chance meetings in the elevator that, hey, I met you by the coffee pot and we, and we started something. Um, culture is very much a person to person item. And so I think companies are gonna have to figure out how do we engage people at the non-work level? Uh, at Zoom, we do things like yoga, exercise classes, happy hours, trivia, name that tune. What our goal is, is to make them understand that, look, we're all working together, but we're all friends and we're, and we're all colleagues. And that during the day, now we don't do these at eight o'clock at night, we don't, right? We do them at three o'clock in the afternoon sometime. What we're trying to say is it is okay to take a break and sort of spend time re-engaging on a personal level. And hopefully we can keep the culture going. What I do think is this, whatever your culture was when you left, I don't think it's gonna be the same culture when you come back. I think that employees have changed their opinion. I have, um, I'm not a millennial, right? I'm a baby boomer as we just said, right? But I think like a millennial now when it comes to working from home. I enjoy working from home. I enjoy the engagement I get. Um, I've changed my whole view. And I think the one thing is you need to set boundaries. You need to make sure that the employees realize that that text that you sent at 10 o'clock at night doesn't need to be answered at 10 o'clock at night. Right. And you really need to set the culture by example. And unfortunately the senior managers, myself included, were working hard. And so it's, it's easy to work hard and it's easy to forget about your culture. You guys, you folks at Zoom have had some amazing success, and Eric was recently recognized in Barron's over the weekend as one of the top 25 CEOs of the year. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you very much. It must be an incredible ride for you, Gary. When you think of the skills required to be successful in this new normal, what comes to mind? So I think from the, the management side, they really do need to reassess the tools they give people. I think that that today people are learning another way of working. Uh, we're seeing a lot more personal tools. Look, Zoom's part of your daily work and it's keeping you connected with mom. And so I think at the end of the day, we really do have to look for these tools that are gonna make people work better, more productive. I like to coin it, I hope I'm coining the phrase, enabling technology. And it's really about the technologies adapting the way people work. People are not working the way the technology wants to work. They're working the way they want to work because the technology is simple and just works. It, it makes them collaborative. It's flexible. It adapts into their desktop. People don't want to be challenged by technology anymore. They want that same frictionless, seamless experience we get with personal technology in the workforce. And we can give it to them. I just think that corporations need to step back and figure out how are they going to work by asking them. That's a big, that's a big thing. Ask them, right? and then figure out the right technology to make them productive, innovative, working together again. And the hybrid is gonna be the hook that says if we can figure this out in a hybrid world, we're gonna be moving forward. That will be the next power company. Gary, you know, big thanks to you, Eric and the team. Uh, you've done a great job and uh, what an amazing story. Thank you. Uh, it really made enterprise uh, video platform communication ubiquitous and easy to use. I don't, not just enterprise though, right? Big consumer play. Um, not only is the CEO doing his board meeting, but his kids are learning on Zoom. And so it's been a really good play from the consumer up to the enterprise. It really has changed the company. Thank you so much for everything you're doing, keeping the community together. And we'll talk to you soon. Great, Gary. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, Jennifer Weston Greenman, CIO of the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Hey, Jennifer, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Nice to be here. Awesome, good to see you. Hey, a little bit about uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, the mission, the vision, what your, what, what your client is like, what you guys are all about, what you're doing now. Sure, so we are a, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be a part of this group. Uh, so Cancer Treatment Centers of America is a national network of hospitals and clinics that is exclusively focused on delivering uh, patient-centered, exceptional patient-centered cancer care. Uh, we do have a hospital in the Philadelphia region, and we're very proud to serve patients in this community. 
um, in my role, I lead enterprise IT for all of our hospitals and clinics. So I have responsibility for all of our applications and technology services teams that are enabling um, an incredible group of clinicians, of physicians, nurses, um, and other caregivers um, to treat this terrible disease. Interesting. Um, you know, healthcare has only recently embraced the whole digital experience. Tell us a little bit, a little bit about your journey. Sure. Well, so CTCA has long been a recognized leader in delivering a, a very compassionate and patient-centered experience, uh, again, to the people who are uh, people who are fighting this terrible disease and their families, because their families are um, the most important member of their care team. Uh, we have been at CTCA empowering our patients and our providers with uh, tools like digital education and interactive patient engagement for years, long before my own arrival, which was just about a year ago here at CTCA. Uh, what we're focused on now, though, is leveraging digital innovation to impact the care of exponentially more patients than when we have been able to do in the past. Um, so how are we doing this? We're utilizing consumer-facing technology, so things like virtual health, virtual care platforms, um, patient portals, something that we've always had in place in healthcare, but are really you know, using to drive a much higher degree of engagement than we have in the past. Uh, we're also leveraging our workforce tools, so tools that all of us have, such as CRM um, or curated knowledge base, collaboration and conferencing. Um, more importantly, probably most importantly, uh, we're investing in data and analytics to drive discovery um, that will lead to new treatments um, and new insights into the mechanisms of, of this disease, which of course is um, very, very um, heterogeneous in nature. Um, and so it's really gonna be the data and analytics and how we, we leverage these just vast amounts of data through artificial intelligence and machine learning to drive new discoveries. Uh, so on the technology front, you know, when I think about how to apply these needs on our, in our technology strategy, you know, we recognize that the digital products key to transforming care delivery um, are going to be sourced from a wide variety of players across the ecosystem. So our role in IT is to create uh, a foundation for secure and scalable interoperability um, so that we can support the agile growth that is needed desperately now in healthcare, particularly with the COVID pandemic, but certainly into the uncertain future that we have um, ahead of us across healthcare delivery. At CTCA, yeah, at CTCA, we're accomplishing this uh, specifically by creating a very robust API layer uh, to enable a seamless experience so that we can connect all these different diverse solutions, some internally developed, some externally developed. But the, the goal is to create a very robust patient and stakeholder experience um, digitally. Jennifer, are there some interesting breakthroughs in the data and analytics uh, space that uh, is really going to help uh, both treatment uh, and prevention? Sure. Oh, absolutely. So in the AI space in particular, um, we're already seeing um, AI advances in imaging, for example, to assist, to augment decision making. It will never replace expert level decision making, but really augment and use um, to help our providers detect disease earlier, which is the goal. Uh, so that it can be treated more effectively. Um, we're also seeing that, um, that these tools can be used to potentially guide therapeutic decisions, given that there's such a large and evolving, rapidly evolving um, knowledge base um, across all disease types, but certainly cancer probably being the most complex. Um, in the realm of discovery in healthcare, we, I think we're increasingly going to see AI drive an unprecedented level of scientific advancement um, this will allow us, in particular, to understand the molecular basis of these diseases so that we can create um, targeted treatments and identify novel therapies to help treat the very personalized um, uh, care plan that you need. Love it. You know, as uh, Gary uh, mentioned, culture matters. Culture is important. What are the strategies that you, you use uh, or employ to inspire and lead uh, in these uncertain times? So what I'd start with by saying is um, we know that the, the tools we talked about, some of the tools I just mentioned, are, are, are enablers. I like, um, I, I like the term used before. They're very much enablers of transformation, and that's true across, I think, all verticals. Um, what I like to tell my colleagues often is the technology is usually the easy part, right? Um, we're const we have to be constantly mindful as technology leaders of the importance of the, the two Ps and the PPT triads, so the people and the process. 
Um, I think at this point, many of us in technology recognize that process engineering is a critical part of any technology initiative. Uh, what I often observe is that the people aspect is frequently neglected, um, particularly in, as it relates to change management and adoption and, utiliz and proper utilization of many of these technologies. This will become increasingly critical for us as technology leaders or as leaders of, of any part of the organization um, as we see the workforce becoming more distributed and more autonomous and quite frankly more anxious given all the uncertainty in the market. Um, so what I do to address this, one of my strategies I'll say is to emphasize connection to purpose. Um, of course I have an advantage in that healthcare organizations do tend to be very um, have very strong value systems, uh, very strong orientation around a common mission. And that's helpful as an intrinsic motivator of our, of our teams. Um, recently during the COVID pandemic, I'll tell you that we've witnessed this incredible effort by all of our teams um, to create digital processes that allow CTCA providers and, and nurses to continue providing an exceptional level of care to meet our, to respond to our patients' needs. Um, it, it's fascinating and it's really rewarding for me because there's this palpable sense of pride by our technology professionals in being able to contribute in a very meaningful and personal way um, that this is important to them both as a, a source of pride of working at CTCA but also because so many of us have been directly impacted by cancer in some way within our lives. So moving forward, what I want to do is I want to channel this sense of purpose um, to continue to drive passion for digital transformation. Of course, always being mindful that we have to balance um, continuity and disruption, you know, particularly in healthcare, which is, you know, a very high risk environment. Um, but based on what I've seen recently and certainly observed over my career, I'm confident that we have both the ability and certainly the drive to succeed in this endeavor. How would you characterize your leadership style? Um, I, I absolutely am a servant leader. I try to contribute um, you know, to my teams and show them that I will roll up my sleeves and do the work with them um, whenever possible. Um, but I also very much believe in empowerment. And, um, and that is a, that's actually a, a fundamental principle of our organization is we want to empower our patients, we want to empower our stakeholders. Um, and I believe very strongly in creating a system, um, a, 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 an environment in which we can empower um, everyone involved to a common mission, which again is to fight this, this terrible disease of cancer. You know, we can only imagine what it's like to lead in this time uh, with all of the complexities of the pandemic uh, and complexities within uh, the cancer space. So thanks for coming on the program today and sharing your, uh, your uh, amazing journey. We'll see you, Jennifer, in a little bit on the panel. Thank you. My pleasure. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, next up, we have Brian Anderson, president of the Judge Group. Uh, for those of you who do not know the Judge Group, this is an organization you have to check out. Really, really impressive. Brian, welcome to the program. Hunter, thank you. It's great to see you and uh, great to see you continuing these virtual uh, events across the world. I think you do an outstanding job and uh, I'm, I'm you know, very proud to be part of this. So thanks for inviting me today to this. Awesome, Brian. Hey, thanks for making it. Um, you know, Brian, you've always impressed me uh, as a leader in our industry uh, in the human capital space, but the judge group goes way beyond that. You have a global reach, you have some amazing clients, and you're doing some amazing work both uh, in your core businesses and new businesses. Um, how would you just define or describe your vision or mission for the judge group? Sure, great question. Um, so we as I've been with the organization for the past 18 years, been in the uh, workforce and uh, technology solutions industry for uh, the past 25 years or so. And at Judge, we're all about really getting under the covers and working to help our customers just figure out what's happening, how they can shift and pivot, how they can develop the best solutions to be competitive. Um, and really just build the best organizations they possibly can. And we do that through a variety of different types of services. There's, uh, we're a professional services firm and we have technology-based solutions, staffing solutions, we have our learning solution division that are offshore solutions. And in the staffing solution business, uh, it's a tremendous space because it really, you know, the staffing industry that's really what makes up and fills the gap in times, especially when a pandemic or recessions happen. So when you typically have, you know, what we've just seen where a lot of people 
have been laid off, they've lost their job, they've been furloughed, um, you know, they're looking for opportunities. So we're always out there to help them and to engage them in different models to get back to work. But the companies, it doesn't change what happens in the world of technology. Companies still need to move forward. And what we saw in this latest pandemic here was a uh, kind of a, a very large boom of, of need around public cloud and digital transformation and you know cybersecurity, right? These 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 uh, movements and disruptions that happen across business didn't stop. If anything, we saw that they actually got a lot more pronounced, and there was a much bigger need, right? Bigger need for collaboration tools. Uh, like Gary had mentioned, and uh, I think that, I mean, I personally have become significantly more proficient. Um, I feel like a college kid again, because I could spin up my own video conference session and, and invite whoever I need to it. And, you know, I learned the other day through our learning group, and we could have learning sessions and then do breakouts within Zoom, which have been absolutely fantastic. So, uh, but then we also, you know, the world of mobile device management just kicked in. And then, of course, AI machine learning, these are just... Uh, very hot buttons across the financial industry, the healthcare industry, uh, tech telecom, government, uh, it's, it's broad based. So, so we're positioned to help organizations determine the right strategy, the right road mapping, the right execution, the right, identify the right talent, and then you know, help these companies be the most competitive in adopting those types of solutions. Uh, that's kind of talking from the technology space. Um, we also saw a big resurgence, really a new kind of uh, a newer line of business come out of this in the telehealth sector. So helping around teledentistry and you know doctor offices, people didn't really want to go into an office or an urgent care. And those doctors also didn't want to uh, lose their patients to other in, you know telehealth platforms that might be looped in with their insurance. So that's been a, a, an area to really help out these different doctor offices and uh, healthcare and medical networks. So that's been a, a pretty big area where we've been able to help out. The healthcare, the healthcare sector, um, you know, we talk about shifting and pivoting and I think every organization out there has had to look at their core business and their people and figure out how they were gonna shift and pivot. Some services all of a sudden went, you know, were cut back where other areas, there was an immediate need for things. And in the healthcare sector, where we would typically help with allied health and, and travel nursing and locum tenants and doctors, providing those resources to organizations and healthcare networks, uh, all of a sudden there was an instant need that we identified for those uh, temperature screeners, right? For organizations that needed to get back to work. So you had the meat packing plants and you know manufacturing and distribution and many other in and healthcare and many other industries that they needed to bring people back to work and do that safely. So uh, we had spun up an, uh, a practice where, you know, you can get medical assistance and um, uh, other qualified medical professionals to go in, train them, provide them the proper PPE, set up a process and workflow so companies can get back to work. That's, and that kicked off and, you know, we have hundreds of those type of people out there doing this now, which has been great. Uh, but now that's evolving into testing, right? And I think there's a lot of question about there. How do you, you know, do, do companies really want to take the stance that they're going to test their people or sequentially test them to come back to work? And uh, we're finding that a lot of organizations, you know, movie productions, in order to get movie sets going, whether you're in the, you know, digital space or legacy cable, these movies and productions got to get going. The meatpacking, you know, and uh, industries like that, they got to bring people back in. So, We've been now building those models and doing the actual testing, whether it's nasal swabbing or um, uh, saliva testing and partnering up with the labs and then putting the staff on site PPE and making sure that people can come back with whether it's a one week testing or two week and lots of studies around the best ways to do that. And then contact tracing. And so it really, I mean, this entire pandemic has been something that has affected all of us. Um, you know, certainly working from home has been the new norm. I think it's been welcome. I think that also changes the landscape for many companies. A lot of companies, you talk about culture and organize, many organizations, you know, some of the largest in the world, right? The largest technology names you could think of. You know, I talk with their executives and historically they don't want anyone to work from home. It's that you have to come in to the building and now that's out the window. And if you look at the technology workers, 
a recent survey showed, uh, I think it was 28% of workers in the IT space, they will only consider an opportunity or job where they can work from home at least partially. So I think that makes us all rethink what that world of work is, is going to be moving forward. I know I've certainly enjoyed the time to be home you know, with my family and my children. I never would have got that time back, right? Hunter, you and I would be traveling in another city somewhere and uh, be able to capture that you know, ability to spend time with your family, work from home, and you can be just as productive. So sure. I think there have been some tremendous things there. And this distributed workforce working from home, now all of a sudden uh, you, can, you can recruit all over North America, right? So um, what are some creative ways that technology executives, CIOs can win at the war for talent? Yeah, good, good question. Um, well, if you look at some of the biggest names out there, uh, Alphabet, Apple, IBM, they've, uh, they've dropped their recruitment for um, the four-year degree, right? They found people with experience, you could bring talent in that knows how to program, knows how to, you know, provide different level of, you know, infrastructure support, and you can kind of train and equip those resources. So they've kind of dropped the, that four-year requirement for some of their positions. Uh, there's other models out there, you know, resources of service, right? So right now companies, budgets are tight, you know, everyone's watching, you know, the dollars, you know, get, do more with less. So resource as a service is a unique model where, you know, I hate to use the, the pay for, you know, only pay for what you need, the uh, Liberty Mutual slogan, but it really is. You only pay for what you need. Um, meaning if you only need a project manager or an architect for maybe 10 hours a week, well, there's now access in the gig economy and to resources like that that are bench resources that can bring tremendous expertise. Uh, and these are just some of the models that we've engage with clients and that we put out there and offer. So that's been very interesting. Then you have the recruit, train and deploy model, which are learning solutions business. We recruit talent, sometimes right out, of, right out of school or, you know, let's say junior talent, then train them and really boot camp them up and get them the right skills that they need and then deploy them out to, you know, to get the actual work done. And then, as you mentioned, the work from home, um, I think that opens a world of opportunity. We're now recruiting for companies where it had to be, let's say, Chicago, downtown, come into our building. Well, now that organization is saying they could be anywhere in the world. It doesn't really matter anymore because then it opens up the world of talent. And there still is, you know, uh, there's still, even though, you know, unemployment is, you know, slightly changed and there's 15 plus percent, you know, of, um, a, you know, I guess reduction in the, the industry for talent. IT is only really reduced by 4% when you look at the staffing industry year over year. So there still is a war for talent and these models certainly can help organizations get what they need. Hey, so how, how important is culture, Brian? I mean, you look at culture fit all the time, right? Culture is everything. Culture is really everything. You know, whether it's, um, you know, how you treat your employees, what you stand for, you know, what your core values in the organization are. And, you know, talent chooses, they choose the company that they're going to go work for, whether it's a six month contract assignment, or they're going to go for five, 10 years as a full-time employee. They really choose the company based on the company's culture. And that has to be part of the recruiting process, the branding, all of those, um, all that information has to be at the forefront because the, you know, the, the individual talent in the workforce are so much more educated. They know what they want. They know what they don't want. And they have many options. So uh, culture is incredibly important to make sure that, you know, say what you stand for, have those policies and procedures in place, you know, and know exactly what you're going to get into, what that work environment is going to look like. Hey, Brian, thanks for coming on the program today. You guys have been a great uh, partner for a long time and you're a good friend. Uh, really cool stuff. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Hunter, thanks so much. Thanks for everything. Based in Philly, right? Philly all the way, baby. <laughs> okay. Great, great. Hunter, thanks so much. And thanks, everyone. Great. Next up, our Reimagining the Business and the Future of Work panel. Uh, Larry Filker. Larry, come on. Welcome to the program. Larry, what's on your mind today? I think you had a mute, mute issue first. There you go. Now we can hear you. You have to press the button. Yes, <laughs> sir. That brings up a good point. Hey. We have a lot of people are still transitioning to work from home. A lot of people are learning how best practices and how to 
how to make it all work. Um, we have a, a large number of um, people that need to still figure out how to work best when working remotely. And we've, we've had communication after communication after communication. We've had videos and best practice sharing. Uh, nobody's an expert. Um, maybe, maybe you, Hunter, maybe you are the expert and you could teach everybody how to work better and doing all these uh, sessions across the globe now and probably have a billion best practices to share. But uh, uh, the out of this pandemic is you have to lead with humility. If you claim you're the best, then there's nowhere to go but down. Exactly, exactly. So we've, we've made this big transition. Um, so uh, uh, for you know, two seconds of background, um, uh, my name is Larry Bilker. I'm the Chief Information Officer, Pyramid Healthcare. Uh, we're a, uh, a team of 2,400 employees across seven states, 100 facilities, servicing about 11,000 patients a day in um, mental health and substance abuse treatment, all centered around behavioral health care. Uh, go ahead, Hunter. No, interesting stuff. Um, you know, post-pandemic, what, what uh, what's, what, what's your mind regarding this, the whole pivot and shift for you? Well, we're actually in the midst of doing uh, the, call it the return to work program right now. And that's all about transitioning into this hybrid uh, telemedicine model for our outpatient businesses. And that's, uh, it's proven to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, we thought that transitioning to, to, remote, to homework was good. Um, now when we're back in the office and we've got some uh, sessions that are being held through telemedicine in the office to people that are remote, some people that are coming into the office face to face like we used to. And then we've got this thing called hybrid where if you think about um, if you're doing what's called a group session, I don't know if anybody's ever been in one of these, but if you have, the rooms are only so big. When you're sitting around a, a circle with chairs, it's not so bad. Now you have to do this thing called social distancing. So your circle becomes much larger. You got to put six feet, six feet between people. How do you fit the same number of people in a room when they're distant? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a, I'm, I'm a, I'm an engineer by trade, but you can draw a circle, try to do the same thing and fit 12 people around a circle, the same size, six feet apart. It, you can't do it. So you have to put some people that are remote and some people that are on site. And it's a bit of an equation, but uh, we have to figure out how to do these things in combination, both remotely and on site. That's what we refer to as hybrid telemedicine. Um, and we've have got you, like 2,000 people doing this. Have you had to innovate? Day. Go ahead, Hunter, sorry. Have you had to innovate yourself? Uh, you know, have you, have you had to drive an innovation agenda? Sure. Well, I mean, th this is old school stuff, but frankly, we had to outfit rooms that uh, rooms that had no technology in it whatsoever and put uh, televisions in there, computers in there, microphones that can pick up the entire room and uh, a webcam that can see uh, wide angle webcams. I mean, this is old school stuff, but doing it rapidly within a week is not so easy to do even with Amazon. Excellent. Any surprises during this whole pandemic? <laughs> There's a new surprise every day. The key is, is, as I think as you started, is using humility and try to uh, remind people that we are in this massive, we are in a pandemic, we're in a transitionary state, and to keep people focused on the prize of providing care. It's somewhat unbelievable or surreal, right? And uh, to keep your mind and your uh, your mind open and your spirit open, so you can actually see, engage what really matters, what's important, and what's not, right? Very true. Very true. Uh, I mean, the the, the um, I think uh, Brian was talking about earlier about a little bit more time to spend with his family. Uh, you can talk about this in a slightly different word. Is about finding better balance. Um, and I uh, I think um, Jennifer mentioned it earlier about. Um, making sure you, you have some, or it might've been Gary who said boundaries uh, about um, uh, making sure that you do sign off, that you go outside for a walk, um, just do something different. I mean, I'm a technologist by trade and by you know the root of my being, but you gotta balance it out or uh, you, you start to climb the walls. Right, stay with us, Larry. we're gonna move on to James. James Kirk, you know, welcome to the program, CTO and Innovation Officer, Brandywine Realty Trust. Innovation's in your title. So what, what do you, how's, how's the pandemic affected the innovation agenda? 
Thanks, Hunter. So yeah, the uh, innovation is in the title, and that was uh, something that Brandywine wanted when I joined them. I've only been with them uh, four months now. So I was in the office for four days. The pandemic had already started, and on my fifth day, it was time to go home. Everybody work remote. So it was, uh, it was hair trigger at that point. Um, one of the biggest things I noticed was, you know, the traditional information technology technologies for working remote were in place. People can VPN in, they can get to their cloud platforms and stuff. What changed was the business processes. So in other words, instead of one person being home and, and working remote with the perspective being that there's many more people in the office, now you have nobody in the office. So there's a bigger impact on business processes. Nobody can walk over to your desk and get something or go tap somebody on the shoulder because you need them for something. Now the entire company has to truly learn to work from home or, or from a remote location. So we, uh, you know, one thing you learn about innovation is innovation often happens when you restrict resources. That's right. That's right. So um, one of the things we're doing is we're starting to leverage existing technologies in newer ways. So for example, um, I was with Liberty Property Trust, which was primarily a uh, industrial, big box industrial REIT, and the product was warehouses. Well, we're looking to take some of the warehouse technology that would monitor forklifts and people walking around the warehouse and things of that nature and bring it into the office space and say, wait a minute, we've got locations around water coolers and things of that nature where we've got um, you know, too many people gathering, we've got too many gathering locations, what can we do? How does our space need to be resigned? So, redesigned. So uh, a lot of the IoT conversations and, and things like that are not necessarily about um, utilizing new technologies, although some of them are, but it's about using technologies that we already have available to us in new and novel ways. You know, James, a little bit about uh, Brandywine Realty Trust, uh, for those who don't know, a uh, little context. Sure. So Brandywine is a uh, commercial real estate REIT headquartered right here in uh, Philadelphia. Um, we have corporate offices in Philadelphia, Richmond, Washington, D.C., and down in Austin, Texas. Um, our portfolio is also in those same areas, although spread out into the various suburbs. It is a office and... Um, urban retail center REIT. So we have many offices with maybe a restaurant in the first floor, you know, some high rises and things of that nature. What's interesting about Brandywine and what, one of the things I really like about the company is they um, focus on their projects interacting with the community. So being in the urban setting where there's offices, you have a lot of neighborhoods, retail centers and college campuses all right around many of our locations. So the interaction with the tenants in the community is significant, uh, significantly more than it was in the industrial REIT. Many times in the industrial REIT, you're, you have a million square foot warehouse in the middle of nowhere, right? And, and you're dealing with zoning and stuff like that, but you don't have the interaction with your community. Here at Brandywine, that's one of their core principles is really the interaction with the community. Do you see uh, the use of office space and mixed uh, uh, layouts changing dramatically going forward? Um, yeah, but not in the way that a lot of people maybe we're, we're fearful. So um, originally, you know, this pandemic hit and all of a sudden it's, you know, offices are going to go away. Everyone's working remote. And I think what we all realized very quickly was, you know, we need a, we need a headquarters. We need some place to go to collaborate with people in person from time to time. So even those companies who are really embracing that remote work lifestyle, they see the need to really kind of gather from time to time. So many of the conversations we're having with existing tenants and potential future tenants now are how can we redesign our existing space, you know, to, to, uh, to deal with the six foot um, safety net around us and, and be a little more healthier in the office. Um, and that's leading to conversations of, you know, tenants who maybe have, we'll say 20,000 square feet with us, maybe they need 25, right? Because they want to redesign things and they want to spread their folks out a little bit. Um, you know, we can all work remote as much as we have. It, it's, I think it's worked out well, but some of these uh, variables with family and pets and kids and everything else, it, it's a challenge when you're spreading that over a long course of time. So um, we're, we're seeing good engagement with tenants on a better and smarter use of space going forward. 
Excellent. James, thanks. Stay with us. Uh, Jennifer, back over to you. Uh, when you think of uh, the role of the CIO uh, as a key player in the C-suite or the, uh, in the business, uh, in, in the, uh, the healthcare practice, how do you think the role will evolve from here? And where's the opportunity? Where's the, the, uh, the blessing in disguise here? I think um, both internally and externally, the role of the CIO is now recognized probably more than ever as a transformation leader and not just the traditional view of, the, of this role being an operator. Um, I think as CIOs, we need to build upon this recent momentum and use this as a platform for further change, particularly given all of the uncertainty that we're facing right now. Um, I'm guessing, you know, if I, I could probably speak for many of my colleagues here, I'm saying that we've really had to hone our skills and adaptation and refine our skills and adaptation in recent months. Um, and, you know, while this has certainly been exhausting at times, I think it's also very much a strength that we need to cultivate and grow. We can't return to the pre-COVID world of structured and, you know, sometimes rigid practices and policies that we follow. Um, I think we need to recognize as, as a group, as a, as a technology leadership team, that we were successful and, in fact, we thrived by being agile and adaptive to the needs of our organizations, uh, in my case, and the need to the needs of our patient population. Um, and this will be, I think, the criti critical success factor that CIOs will need to continue to be successful in the future. You want to elaborate on that? That's a fascinating insight because I actually was on this as well. I think how you lead going forward through the pandemic, through this crisis, really defines you as your, uh, in your pro professional persona and your impact in your current role, but future opportunities mm -hmm. and folks that leaned into it and really led into, leaned in and led into it, really redefined their, their organization's impact as well as the future opportunity and role for them in that organization and their future career ascent. Absolutely. Um, in our case, and I think Larry mentioned it as well, you know, the, the standard care delivery model historically has been bricks and mortar. You know, with virtual care, it's just a, you know, sort of a, a niche almost. Um, my opinion is virtual care, telehealth will be the standard of care delivery in the future. Um, that will be the, the common expectation for our patients, for us as, as members of our community. Um, and so what we've seen in healthcare, and I'm, I'm guessing others can probably echo this, is you know, the role, um, our role, and certainly the impact of our teams in driving that transformation, not in months, not in weeks, but usually days for most of us, going from, you know, uh, I would say, you know, double digits perhaps in virtual appointments to having thousands of virtual appointments and having to be able to support that technology infrastructure. More importantly though, be able to support the, the totally redefined operating model that comes with that because it's not just the conferencing and collaboration tools, but if you think about it, it's all the processes that surround care delivery. Um, that takes a broad understanding of the environment that we work in and a willingness to step, step forward and do things that might be outside of our kind of prior role. I mean, for example, um, you know, I have a help desk like many of us do um, that primarily caters to workforce members, right? Work for, and so we're used to our enterprise technologies, our enterprise tools that we support. Um, but in the case of virtual care, you're now supporting a vastly larger number of consumer grade technologies, as well as um, a, a much higher degree of variation in competency as it relates to the use of the technology. Uh, so we have patients who, um, aren't familiar with how to set up Wi-Fi, um, who don't know how to access their emails, um, who really need a lot of support from a technology point of view. And, you know, again, in the past, um, there might have been a, a little bit of a resistance, I would say, to being able to take on that role, but we knew we had to step forward um, and, and embrace that position to be able to support our patients, um, our consumers, um, in this entirely new world that we're living in of COVID. Excellent. Thanks, Jennifer. Stay sure. with us. Uh, hey, James, why don't you turn your uh, camera on as well, and we'll uh, open it up. Larry, you as well. Uh, you know, Larry, when you think of the leadership uh, lessons learned, what was the biggest lesson you learned in the past uh, three months? Well, there's more than one, certainly. <laughs> and um, okay. I think the, the biggest thing is to listen first. This is not, this isn't just for the past three months, but it's listen first, assess rapidly 
and I and this goes to the first the, the past three months, assess very, very rapidly what the need is. And then determine and innovate a solution as fast as humanly possible. Um, Jennifer just talked about the like the future of telemedicine. And we transitioned over 800 clinicians in a matter of three days from working solely face to face to working solely remotely in a telemedicine fashion. Uh, we did have some of the tools in place, but we didn't have the capacity. So we were doing massive change. And the key is pe keep keeping people focused um, and uh, on target. This, this is not, like I said, it's not about just what's in the past three months, uh, is keeping people focused on the prize. So it's really not a whole lot different from what you would do normally. Just the speed at which we are working is drastically, drastically increased. Is uh, telemedicine here to stay? Absolutely. I don't think it's going away. Uh, it's if, if you're in the uh, the younger population, it's an expectation. But I think the uh, even uh, people of all ages have now gotten quite comfortable uh, doing telemedicine, Zoom, just chatting with family members. Um, so get Gary, a testament to you and your company. Um, it, it's super easy. Uh, and anything that's super easy to use, people will repeat, they'll talk about, uh, and they'll be able to use it anywhere. Excellent. Thanks, Larry. James, uh, same question for you. Uh, any kind of innovation that you've achieved over the past 120 days that's here to stay and you're going to extend it? Um, so certainly around the business processes and AI, right? What can be done that maybe before was a 10 step task, what can we automate? So I think automation has certainly jumped ahead from a priorities perspective from a, um, you know, how can we be more efficient in our business? Um, and then bringing those tools to the forefront. So uh, gone are the days of, uh, for example, uh, checking a box, right? To say, I need, a, I need a DR plan or a business continuity plan and it'd be nice if some of it was automated. Now, with the crisis we're in now, you know, we have to be able to, at a moment's notice, everybody go home, everybody work somewhere else. Um, coworkers may not be available for a couple weeks at a time, right? This isn't the this isn't the far-flung example of, um, you know, somebody uh, is no longer with us. What's our what's our plan to replace that person? Now, it's several people could be down and out with an illness, right? So I think that the um, the old school DR business continuity plans um, have got to be matured for the current state of affairs, and that's going to continue going forward. That's not going to change. That is a new way of thinking. What does uh, winning look like coming out of this? I, I know if you're a CEO in a for profit business in healthcare, you're looking at building market share, building uh, uh, customer uh, engagement, right? Mm -hmm. For a tech leader, what does winning look like in this model? Anyone want, anyone want to jump in there? Besides keeping just the lights on and keeping everything running and everybody connected and, you know, besides what you would call the basics, sure. uh, help, helping people use the technology more. I think someone used the words enablement, um, enabling the people to use the technology to the best of its ability. James just talked about AI and machine learning and being able to apply newer technologies uh, but it's all about enabling people, process and technology to perform better. I would say um, agility and versatility are the keys to success moving forward. I mean, clearly none of us could have predicted the circumstances we would be in today, six months ago or a year ago. Right. Um, and we as technology leaders have to be the first ones to respond and make a total 180 shift if needed uh, in our strategy to be able to uh, respond and react um, to preserve and hopefully grow the business going forward. Great. James? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's continuing to look at the new and innovative technologies that are out there and, and looking at them from a business use case perspective, not just uh, looking at the new shiny object and you know, we like it, let's get it implemented and slam it in and say that now all of a sudden we're automated and we're digitally transformed, right? Digital transformation doesn't come on a box. It doesn't come on a, on a DVD. 
Um, it is as much cultural and business process and people oriented as, as it is technology oriented. Have you noticed any increased uh, innovation just based on the platform and the technology of having Zoom or another video platform where you're not in person and you have to get to an idea and a point quicker on a digital format than you would if you were in a conference room for a day or two day session. Have you noticed that happen at all? I, I think there's an increased comfort level from the majority of employees who maybe have not um, traditionally used collaboration tools in the past mm -hmm. because there was not widespread work from home in some organizations. I think the various platforms made it very simple as part of their product to use their products. Uh, Zoom in particular, I'll throw Zoom one here, right? So um, it, it's very much logical, you know, whether you're on a phone, a tablet, a laptop, a couple clicks and, and here we are talking with uh, where we got 72 participants here, right? Um, it's, um, it, it, it's been made very, very easy, that adoption rate. And without that adoption, that ease of adoption, I think we would have had um, all sorts of other problems when this came in. You know, famous you quote. imagine doing this, this kind of an event 10 years ago? No, right? Hey, no. you know, thanks James and, and Larry and, and Jennifer. You know, a famous quote from uh, the late Steve Jobs, right? Think differently. Yep. Uh, it's kind of our play on this, the conference team reimagining the business and the nature of work. What has this allowed you to do, Larry, in terms of right now, where are you today and you're thinking that you wouldn't possibly have been there 120 days ago, but today you are now because we've walked through 120 days of hard work, maybe for some of us, hell, and now you're looking forward to the future. I mean, we're looking at uh, potentially like, and this is a bit techie, but uh, like more of a network redesign, trying to get them to take more advantage of hybrid models where we can use more of our, what's um, the new term from Gartner is uh, the secure edge, a secure access edge networking uh, to be able to push more and take advantage of more of that distributed networking that we have out there, which lowers our cost and allows people to work faster, better, cheaper in, in extended worlds, um, even extending out your network into people's home, homes. And uh, I think Jennifer mentioned also about having to provide support. So the more standardized we can make things, the easier it is to support helping that those help desks out of the, in the world. Uh, Cause it's, uh, everybody's different. Everybody's got their own setups everywhere. And then just making it easier, giving us the right tools, putting tools in the right places and um, allowing people to stay connected and collaborative because we're all distributed and with this uh, pandemic stuff is probably not going to go away. It's probably not the last time we see this, even though the, we'd love to have it be the last time. But the fact of the matter is it's probably going to happen once, twice, maybe three or four more times in our lifetimes. Thanks, Larry. Jennifer? Yeah, so I think that we'll, um, yeah, I think one of our key takeaways will be, you know, just the constant need to vigorously communicate and connect with our teams. Um, and not just our teams, but our workforce and our executive colleagues. I, I know one of my key takeaways has been the reminder that, you know, we cannot over communicate during any time, but certainly a time of crisis. And we have to leverage all available channels, all tools we have. So certainly the collaboration tools that we've talked about have been uh, tremendously helpful in that regard. Um, but we need to, we need to have, you know, everything from emails to town hall events, uh, chat, every, all we can do to communicate the what, but really importantly, the why, of what we're doing and the contributions we're making and really the future vision and strategy that our organization will follow. Excellent, thanks Jennifer. Mm -hmm. James? So I think one of the um, toughest things for any technologist is to start the conversation when you're introducing something new, right? Because one of the most frustrating responses we get is, well, this is the way we always do things. <laughs> I think now, that we've been through or, or are still going through this, that conversation goes away. Um, everybody kind of sees that there is a need to change things for the better and start to look a little differently. I think one of the things we're seeing is um, everybody across every department is looking internally at themselves, at their own groups and saying, how could we change things even if it's a little bit uncomfortable? 
And I think that drives innovation at a cultural level within our organization. Anything keep you up at night, James, at this point? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, you know, certainly some of those um, core IT challenges with remote access and system availability, right? Because folks are now online, uh, honestly, all longer at all, all different hours. So uh, your, your typical nine to five workload model is, is not necessarily the same in some organizations. So I think some of those traditional challenges still exist and, and in some cases are expanded. Excellent. You, you, James, you still having fun? Uh, absolutely. How important is fun? Fun is, uh, it's probably, it's probably 40% of the pie, right? It, it's a big piece. You got to have fun with your team, your coworkers, your peers. So how do you do that in these really trying times? Um, look, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm a, I'm a diehard Philadelphia sports fan. So I know what letdown is even when you're having fun. So, um, you know, I think, um, I think, um, you know, the technologists are, are, are a rare breed. We, 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 we kind of know how to have fun in some oddball ways. And, and we look at the bright side of things. And, and when we, we succeed, we share that amongst ourselves and our peers. And, and everybody sees it as a success. Thanks, James. Uh, Jennifer, can you, can you still have fun in this kind of stressful environment? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we, um, you know, in some respects, we probably connect even more frequently because now we're all working from home and we all desire that connection more. So I find that, you know, the personal interactions I have, the team interactions I have, I think, you know, people are genuinely um, desiring that type of interpersonal connection and collaboration, whatever form it takes, you know, whether it's the virtual happy hours that we talked about or whether it's one-on-one -on -one meetings or town halls and um, so, no, I think, I think we're having a lot of fun. I think we're really proud of what we've accomplished and excited about what we will do in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Larry, final word? Oh, it's Jennifer and James's comments have kind of captured all, but you know, try to have some fun. If you can disconnect, I know everybody carries their cell phones. They even go out for walks. Try not to text and walk now. It's used to text and drive. Try not to text and walk. Uh, but... Um, yeah, find some balance if you can. So it's, it's very important, uh, both short and long term. And communicate, as Jennifer said, over communicate, whether it's a town hall, whether it's just a team meeting, whether it's say, these virtual lunches, happy hours, whatever it takes, just keep people connected because you don't want them, uh, uh, you want, just want, don't want them running amok. You want people to feel mm -hmm. uh, loved, cared for, connected, part of teams, and because if, if you can still perform well when this distant, you'll be able to perform in anything. Well said. Thanks, Larry. Jennifer, Thanks, great Larry. job. James, great job. Larry, appreciate your engagement. Uh, stay with us if you can. Will do. Thank you. On to our next uh, panel, up an industry search executive update. Uh, Beverly, welcome to the program. First up, good to Hi, see you. Hi, Hunter. Hi, great to be here. How are you? I am excellent. Thanks for uh, being engaged. Good. Nice to be here. So, Bev, what's in your mind? Well, this is a, a strange and different uh, time we're in. And I think as, as we are uh, over three months into this, we are adapting. And we are getting used to uh, a lot of Zoom meetings as our primary way of, of meeting people in the world. And what I think is very, very cool and positive about this is, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm communicating with the Philadelphia audience. I'm in Westport, Connecticut. And a couple of weeks ago, I was here and communicating with folks in San Francisco. So, you know, the good news is we, you know, we're, we're kind of geographically agnostic. You know, the downside is we are you know, sitting more and, you know, uh, probably not taking enough walks and getting enough fresh air, but uh, that's something we can control. And, and I think we're getting better at it. Excellent. And uh, have you conducted your first final search uh, digitally? I have, I have. And Tell it's us the about first it. time ever that uh, the client and the candidate only have met via uh, a variety of Zoom meetings. We we planned and pondered a, a, a personal get together, you know, in a park somewhere, but the candidate is not local. 
and did not want to fly into you know, the new city. So it's a leap of faith. And I think everybody is, um, is excited and optimistic about that hire. It's a very senior level position, CIO reporting to uh, a CEO. Never before has this been done, but uh, you know, I did all the due diligence that I would normally do in terms of reference checks. And uh, you know, I, I, think we're, I think we've done well. I think Congratulations. Well. Thank you. Excellent. Aileen, good to see you. Thanks for making the program. Thanks. Good to see you. Say hello to all your new neighbors, right? So uh, I know <laughs> you made the move. You're in, you're in the Philly office for Corn Ferry, right? A little. You want to set a little context? What you're doing now? Sure. No, and I got my. Hopefully, you can see the my, my Philadelphia sign here here in the back. But yeah, after 13 years in Washington D.C., uh, moved back home. Uh, and in here outside of Philadelphia, in the home office now, Hunter, today, <laughs> but so uh, till we get to get back to Center City. Uh, but in addition to the work I'm doing in technology, uh, I'm also leading our, our Philadelphia offices, office, which is one of our larger offices here in North America and, and home to what we call KF Digital. So we too are, we're eating our own dog food and we're going through our own transformation. And we've got a lot of uh, folks that are coding and developing and uh, got user experience teams that are helping us as, as we become more nimble in how we deliver. So your uh, your your specialty is CISO search and security. How has the role changed just in the past three months? In general, um, you know, it's doing work a bit broader. I mean, security. I would say cyber, um, like some other technical areas, has continued. Uh, we've, we've continued to see some needs. Um, we've actually had some situations where uh, perhaps there was a hiring freeze, but uh, the role of CISO uh, was, was deemed uh, mission critical, just given this posture uh, that, that we've been in. So we, we have sustained those projects and uh, more heavily in critical infrastructure uh, in particular. Uh, so where there's um, just from a manufacturing perspective, et cetera, uh, so we've seen we've seen projects there. We've also, you know, outside of security, uh, there there also continues to be be some needs for for CIOs or CTOs, particularly those who can drive you know a digital journey. Okay, gotcha. Um, has there been additional uh, uh, activity in terms of CISO searches right uh, right now? When we came out, I mean, interest in in about where we were three months ago. Um, there, there was some, some spike in activity. Uh, I think what, what occurred there is there were perhaps where there had been a gap and just wanting to leverage, you know, a third party, a firm, uh, who could help, uh, with that, that recruiting versus keeping, keeping that in-house with, with town acquisition. So we did see, see a, a, a bit of a, a surge there. Um, you know, it's, it's now, you know, we're, we start getting to this time of summer. Um, we're not quite seeing quite that spike, but there's more moderated activity at this stage. Interestingly, though, Hunter, I will share what we're getting picked up, uh, getting uh, queried on now outside of recruiting is perhaps uh, doing some internal uh, assessment to think about um, from a succession perspective, right? Down, you know, really looking at the bench strength. So taking an internal scan first before, before going to the outside. I see Hugo nodding, so he might be seeing some of the same things as well. Well, Hugo, welcome to the program. Hugo Freuline, uh, Managing Director of Diver Diversified Search. Welcome. Well, thank you, Hunter. Happy to be Please here. So wh what are you seeing out there, Hugo? Um, we're seeing some good things. Um, now, overall, and you know, I think our overall search business is, is definitely taking a hit. Uh, I, I'd say we're 60% of what we were, but technology is not one of those areas that's being affected is, is bad. Um, there's been a couple, literally a couple searches that we've had to put on hold for three months, particularly in healthcare, because healthcare has been hit very hard um, in, in certain areas when you go to the elective surgeries and, and the like. So, so revenue is down and there's been some hiring freezes and postponement, but CIO, CTO searches are uh, have been, you know, fairly strong, and there's a lot in there's a lot of talk of things in the pipeline, in digital, in data, 
uh, related, whether it be a chief data officer or the like, uh, or CTO, CIO. So how have you, how have you adapted your, your go-to-market strategy and uh, yeah. how, do you think, how do you think you'll change over the next 12 months? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I don't see a lot of difference on the candidate side of things um, because we were using video and, you know, Zoom. I mean, Zoom was my, my preferred choice uh, before this uh, anyway. But we've been using that for, for the candidate side a lot because clients demand it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a better cost uh, model for, for our clients as well. Where the big changes is on the client side and, and um, business development and actually closing searches. I've got two searches uh, that we've closed, CIO searches that have closed with never seeing the client or the candidate, um, if, if you will. Um, and then they, you know, typically what happens is that they might um, on, on the hiring uh, date, you know, we'll get together before we all work remotely again. But um, it's been very successful. I think, um, if you will, business development side of it has been more challenging. Um, a lot more RFP type work, um, a lot more presentation. Um, but again, there's um, using the videos and the Zooms and the webinars, it's actually uh, worked well. Uh, we're not hopping on planes. Things you know, can actually speed up in terms of the process if, if somebody's eager to do a hire. So all in all, it's been, it's been pretty positive. Thanks, Hugo. You know, um, Bev, you know me for a while, Aileen as well, Hugo and uh, John. I take a bit of a hit. I'm very, I'm all, all, often I'm very positive or over optimistic. Uh, I think now there's a better opportunity than ever to be in a, in a technology a professional, whether it's a CIO, CTO, CTO or CISO. And it's all how you brand and position yourself and get your name out there. And John, you, you know this. I mean, isn't now the best time ever for the CEO to find the right technology executive to drive that digital agenda for the whole company? Whether you're in healthcare, whether you're selling cars, you're Elon Musk, or trying to compete with Elon, or you're selling Pepsi or you're a banker. Every company is all of a sudden a technology company. But we've known that for 20 years. John? Right. Yeah, so it, it, it's going to sound a little self-serving, giving what I and, and what we do for a living. But yes, I mean, I think companies should absolutely be investing in hiring IT executives right now. And you're right, right? Companies are technology companies now, right? There is a lot of uncertainty in the market. Companies are nervous about budgets and spending and cash and so forth. But strong executives, strong leadership teams, strong IT executives in particular they're the folks that are going to guide and lead companies through this uncertainty and out of the pandemic. So if there are open seats at the table, again, specifically the technology spot, now's the time to make sure they're filled in my opinion, as opposed to waiting. And I think it'll be well worth the investment. So how best to re thanks John, how best to reposition yourself if you're in a current role, you're not hundred percent happy because technology isn't considered a, a competitive accelerator or a competitive advantage in the C-suite in the boardroom. How best to reposition yourself and get on your radar screen, Beth? Well, I think um, you know the, the best way to reposition yourself is to you know connect with people like you know Hugo, John, Eileen, myself. Let us know you know that you want to make a change. I think uh, one of the ways to be convincing about making that transition, if you will, if you're in a manufacturing company and you want to go into a services industry, you really need to look at what experiences you've had that are relevant to a services company. You know, maybe that services company doesn't have a supply chain, but they have really important marketing and CRM capability. And that's part of what your role was. I think the other thing is, if you want to make a change and, and get into a different industry or a different reporting structure, you want to, you know, look at your own capabilities. You know, it's, this is a good time to self-reflect. You know, how are you coming across? Do you have a brand that's standing out in a way that you want it to? Are you known for being a progressive you know, leader? Are you known for being a great advocate of agile development and, 
if you have you know, put your money where your mouth is? Have you spoken on these topics? Are you a blogger on these topics? Have you been invited by Hunter Muller to speak on any of these topics? This is a time when getting yourself ready for uh, more exposure is going to benefit you across you know, recruiters and, and different organizations. Yeah, really well stated. Excellent, thanks. Aileen, same question? Yeah, no, I mean, I think Bev really, really outlined it, it well. I think it's, again, reach out to any of us. And I always say this to you, you know, Hunter is this, this platform to be also part of that and to be uh, perceived as a thought leader, right? And really get your voice out there and, and perspective is, is always a good opportunity. Also allows you to stress test those communication skills, presentation skills, which we know are key, uh, particularly for CIOs, CTOs chief data officers uh, and, and the like. Um, I think, you know, again, we, you, it's a lot of what's been talked about, but being able to identify yourself as a change agent, somebody who can help with not just digital transformation, but digital acceleration, um, nimble, adaptable. Um, we're all in the talent business, so being a bit of that talent magnet. Um, uh, also being an inclusive leader, so as you think about your teams and, and bringing diverse teams together in, in every sense, um, you know, we, we definitely see, see, see that. And we're here in Philadelphia, so I always talk about grit, you know, sort of quoting Angela Duckworth. So, you know, some grittiness and passion and perseverance, you know, can set you apart as well. Well said. Love it. John, you want to jump in there? Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, I agree with everything that, that, that Bev and Eileen just said obviously, but I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that we always look for uh, when we interview and when we're assessing IT executives is folks that not only come with the, um, the technology skill set and, and the technical skills and whatnot, but folks that, that come with, with the network, right? Folks that have a Rolodex, folks that, uh, you know, if you, you get a question from your management team or a, a problem, some sort of an issue pops up internally, right? You have the resources to go to, right? Um, just folks that are, are well networked in whatever community they're in. Because uh, we always, you know, we, we say it all the time at Fidato, your, your network is the strongest tool you have, right? So um, if a CIO reaches out to me or to anybody at our firm, you know, it's, it's, you know, we look for the folks that are coming with something as opposed to just, hey, you know, how's the market? Or, hey, do you have anything for me? Or, you know, hey, uh, do you have any roles open right now that you think I'd be a fit for? Right? It's folks that come with something. Hey, I, I just read this article. I think you find it interesting. Hey, I just met this person. I think you should meet them as well. Can I make an introduction for you? You know, that's, that's big as well. So sharing as well as asking for something. But um, yeah, just in general, the whole idea of, of being a networker and being plugged in um, and, and just having resources outside of whatever business you're in. I think that's really important. and something we look for all the time. That's really well said, John. You know, we started early with, on with this notion of leading courageously passionately, authentically, uh, with humility. Then we built on it with J&J, &J, uh, Jim Swanston, talking about uh, you know, servant leadership, from leading from the heart. A different kind of idea or a different way of communicating. Uh, Hugo, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I do want to add one thing there, too, to, to what everybody's thoughts. And, and one of the things that we always talk about is courage, too, Hunter. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity to do all the things that we've all just said, but also use the social media, use LinkedIn. I mean, look at HMG, <laughs> look what we do, look at all the information on there, but have the courage to ask your peers questions and also have the courage to, to give your opinion of, of where things are going. And I think you're gonna find a lot of people are gonna be reaching back out to you. Um, you, you're going to get a lot of hits and a lot of people coming back to you. It's a great way to expand your network um, and into addition to all the things that we've, we've, we've just mentioned. But communication, back to your uh, question, is, is absolutely uh, critical. And I think um, when, you, when you, going back to some of the th thoughts that Gary had and, and Larry had, you know, we're, we're evolving. We've been through this first, oh, we all got to work remote and now we're going to be you know, some of us are going to be working remote and some of us are going to be in the office, you know, moving forward. And how is that going to look like and who's going to work where and when? 
I think this communication piece and how you do it, uh, it's going to be in different ways. Um, and I, you know, I, I just think again, the lens on the communication is, it's got to be a very inclusive. You got to be really thoughtful in how you communicate and who you communicate with. Um, and you got to really be inclusive that way. But there's a lot more going on than COVID right now. Um, if you think about the unrest, if you think about you know the challenges of diversity, all these things have to be blended into how you communicate and how you say things to your to your team and to your to your peers. Really well said, and uh, and to do it all through a computer screen, right? That's right. It's hard. All of a sudden, we're all now TV net network broadcasters. You know, and, and and Hunter, you can you know you know me well enough for years. I use my hands, and I'm I'm kind of animated here, and it's <laughs> it's it's a good thing this is pretty uh, live, right? But you know, people like me are used to being more, um, you know, just. Um, in person friendly, you know, that's one of the things that you said earlier, you know, there's a lot of advantages, right? We can do things, we can be in many different places where we couldn't be uh, in one week and do this. But then there's that personal relationship is to, you know, you, you gotta make sure that you're communicating and you're doing things in this mode that can still support how you used to do it before. And that's, we're all learning how to do that. That's right. That's right. Uh, but can you actually envision going back to work in a major city, say New York, and uh, going up an elevator where they probably have to sequence, you have to probably have a reservation in the tall buildings just to get into the building? Yeah, it's funny, you know, um, Hunter, you know this, that, you know, um, our office in New York is in the Chrysler building on the 49th floor, and, and uh, we're not opening that office through September. Uh, and that's that was planned a while ago, but I can't personally envision myself getting on Metro North, going to Grand Central, not very often anyway. <laughs> I can tell you that it's it's going to be a challenge to do that. Interesting, Interesting time. Hey, Bev, final comment. You know, I think um, looking at the fall and looking optimistically at you know some of our restrictions being lifted, I think that you know CIOs will be able to get together in person with portions of their teams in an outdoor setting, September, October, for the New Englanders, you know, the Midwest folks same, and West Coast maybe um, anytime, but uh, gatherings in parks, gatherings in, and maybe taking a hike, uh, doesn't have to be all thought leadership discussions all the time but just the outreach and the ability to, you know, have some fun together, um, we're all really desiring that. I think we're gonna see a hybrid return, like Hugo said, I mean, I'm not gonna get in an elevator and go up to the 49th floor of any building until there's probably a vaccine, because I can't be sure who's gonna walk onto that elevator and that I'll be six to 10 feet apart. Um, I think we continue to have virtual meetings as a reality for the rest of our lives, supplemented by in-person gatherings that are controlled. So I think that's going to be the new normal. It won't be, I think we've lost some of the freedom that we enjoyed, um, you know, before 9-11, right? There's just going to be a little more uh, concern and trepidation about viruses and it doesn't go away. It doesn't mean though we stop looking for opportunities to connect, commune, you know, get together. Bev, thanks for your uh, engagement and partnership for oh, probably over 20 years. Happy to, happy to be part of this. Thank you. Excellent. Aileen, uh, final comments? No, I mean, I think Bev and, and Hugo have said it. I mean, I, you know, again, we can't underestimate sort of that power and need to belong, to stay connected. And it was said in just the, the session prior, just that communication and, and just to keep communicating and, and sort of foster that. So um, we're all gonna learn the art of that. I think I'll be an optimist down the road that, that hopefully that piece doesn't go away either of, of how leaders start to show um, just that human side of, of who they are. 
And if technology leaders can lead the way, then we're all better for it. Excellent, thank you. Hugo, final comment? Well, I, I don't know what to, more to add to that, but um, you know, I, I, again, there's a lot of changes. We've talked about this and how our teams are gonna look too. Um, and you know, I, I'm, you know, Diversified Search, we're, we're very big on diversity and inclusion. And, and I, I think this is gonna become um, more and more important as we move forward. Um, so, you know, and, and that just affects how every, whatever we do and how, our, how we communicate with folks. So um, I, I'd say that we gotta be very conscious of how our workforce is gonna be changing over the next year plus. Thanks for your engagement, Hugo, and friendship. You're a great guy. Thank you. Great partner. Uh, hey, John, final word? Yes, sir. So uh, just in, in talking about relationships and communicating and, and networking and all the things we've been talking about during this panel, I think um, one of the biggest lessons we've learned during COVID, obviously, is that technology is a wonderful thing. But even though it is a wonderful thing, and even though we know it works, we can not allow it to take the place of in-person interaction more than we need it to, right? So if people absolutely need to work from home, we now know they can do it and it'll work. But if they can be in the office with other people, they should be, at least to a certain extent, right? If an interview process absolutely needs to happen via video, we now know that we can make that work and work well. That being said, we should always conduct at least one round of interviews in person if we can, right? If you're doing a group huddle to discuss a project, for instance, yes, you can have that meeting via video, but to the extent you can get together in person, you should, right? Because there, there is no substitute for real in-person interaction in the business world and, and the office place, right? Technology rocks, right? We all know it. That's what we're here talking about. It's there when we need it, but we can't abandon in-person interaction altogether, or we're also, as a result, going to abandon our relationships, and that can't happen. So that's just my two cents and final word. Thanks, John. Great job. Hugo, really appreciate it. Bev and Aileen, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Hunter. Thank Next up uh, is our Securing the Future of Work session. Rocco Grillo. Rocco, welcome to the program and take it away with your rock star panel, please. Awesome. Thank you, Hunter. Thanks, everyone. Always a pleasure to join uh, friends, colleagues, and industry experts at HMG. Um, just another one to roll out and to Hunter's point, uh, pleased to be able to lead a session with some rock stars. Um, just listening to all the expertise and the things that are going on in the industry, who could have predicted the last three months? And for myself, um, I'm a managing director with Alvarez and Marsal. I lead our global cyber risk and incident response investigation. I'd say over the last 10 years, 12 years, helped companies respond to some of the largest cyber attacks in the industry. But if anything, the last three months, um, you know, outside of saying, wow, we, we've seen things from ransomware attacks, uh, attacks on the cloud, business email compromise. I can't say phishing one more time, spiking through the roof. Um, e even further to that, uh, third parties, and that's almost it seems like the, the new norm. If we can't get to the target, attackers are going after the third party service providers. And last but not least, um, the fraud and the nation state attacks that are going on. Um, as much as I mentioned, you know, being uh, ready and prepared to respond to them, if it's taught us anything, um, being resilient and looking at contingency planning and further. Um, to that end, I'd like to just uh, introduce the panel of expertise that we have here. I'm going to hand off to them in a moment to get, talk a little bit about themselves and the theme of our session, um, so securing uh, the future of work. Um, with us today is Michael. I went off from iConnective, uh, uh, Sudan Shu Carib from uh, Comcast, and last but not least, Costas Georgiakopoulos from Procter & Gamble. Um, Michael, if you wanna kick us off, that would be great. Sure, well, it's a pleasure to be with uh, this group today. Uh, always a pleasure to hear insight from professionals that have represented here and get the questions from other uh, peers in the industry. My name is Mike Iwanoff. I am the Chief Information Officer, Chief Information Security Officer for iConnective. iConnective is a global telecommunication services company providing 
some services that you may be aware of uh, through the industry and some services that are really uh, hardline for the telecom carriers. The services you may be familiar with, we manage the um, number registry so, and hardline number registry that is used for porting numbers. So if you ever go and uh, wanna upgrade your phone or you move to a different carrier from like AT&T to Verizon, uh, iConnective is the company in the back end that is managing the, uh, the porting of that number when you wanna keep your number and move over to the new carrier. Uh, in addition to that, you may be familiar with short codes uh, for all of you. Uh, fine gentlemen and ladies out there who are watching Dancing with the Stars at the same time my wife and I are watching it or uh, um, American Idol or any of those where uh, at the end of the episode you get to vote for your favorite individual. Uh, that is actually utilizing short codes. It is uh, texting a certain value to a certain number and on the back end I connect it has to manage that and make sure all of the carriers are familiar with what those codes are and where they're supposed to go and how it's managed. And so those are some of the things that you may be aware that we do and many of other things like uh, CMDB, CMDB type database stuff and uh, routing information that we provide to carriers that allow their, their en uh, entities to interconnect. And lastly, I would just say uh, up and coming, uh, iConnective is leading the effort on addressing robocalling. So we are really a trust anchor in the industry. The carriers are trusting iConnective to put forward and we've already launched a part of that solution it's called the policy administrator, which allows all other service uh, providers and certificate authorities to work with us so they can start um, basically tagging or certifying their phone calls that are coming through the telecommunications network so that on your end of the phone call, you can start seeing whether or not it's a trusted party. And if it's not, then it is a uh, spammer slash a, um, a robocalling malicious uh, attacker. <laughs> so. We're uh, working to put that in place and uh, uh, hopefully these things are getting adopted really soon for all of our benefit. Thank you, Rocco. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And a lot of great things happening there at iConnective. It's fortunate, you know, we were speaking to the three of you, just hearing the different things that your companies are doing. Uh, Sudanshu, um, want to go up next? We'll take you maybe on mute. I was on mute. Got it, there you go. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Rocco, and thanks for having me. This is uh, this is actually my first uh, HMG session ever. So, I've known Rocco for years, and he asked me to attend. So, it's really been a really been a great session so far. Some great some great insights from everybody. Um, so, I am the um, the vice president of uh, cybersecurity, governance, risk, and compliance at at Comcast Cable. I think probably most of you know Comcast Cable. You provide internet services, uh, whole you know whole slew of residential services, and also uh, services out to uh, businesses. Uh, my role is really focused on a part of the information security team. My, my, my role is focused on, uh, on security governance, all things related to security compliance, um, awareness and training. Uh, so just, uh, you know, I really, really work with a lot of the different constituents within Comcast Cable um, in, in terms of supporting their, uh, their initiatives. I do want to say, hey. Sanchez, that I really love my Xfinity X1 service. And awesome. uh, the ability to now set recordings for my phone. Thank you for that. That's great. Good to hear. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Adanchu. Yep. Costas, over to you, my friend. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, my colleagues, and uh, hopefully, I can provide some insights and contribute uh, some meaningful uh, points to the conversation. I'm Costas Georgiakopoulos. Uh, I am the global CISO for Procter & Gamble. Uh, we are uh, the largest consumer goods manufacturing company in the world, operate out of 85 countries. And uh, Rocco, to your point earlier on, who could have predicted it? I, I don't know about predictions, uh, but certainly we saw our business uh, in China be impacted uh, late in the fall. Um, and while we certainly had no expectations of the magnitude of this here, uh, in the U.S., I think some of those early learnings uh, that we took away were certainly helpful uh, in our response uh, to the pandemic and our ability to, to pivot and change. Fantastic. Thanks, Costas. And I really want to jump into some of the questions. I know we have a limited amount of time, but with the three of you and your experiences, we could probably take the whole afternoon and have everybody at the edge of their chairs. Um, you know, one of the things we, you know, I, I rattled off a couple of the things that we were seeing in helping clients, 
but at the same time, you know, Michael, uh, right when we were talking, you know, we, we were talking about some of the spikes in fishing and, you know, just the different ransomware attacks and so forth. There's so many different things that evolved over the last three months. Um, there's some of the things that, you know, I, I almost like to call them blind spots. What are some of the things that you think may be unrealized or that uh, companies, not so much overlooking, but areas that, you know, we're, we're looking towards employees and going from, you know, the workforce being at our headquarters to overnight almost being uh, remote. What are some of the things that you think companies may, may be overlooking or even as we go into the future state uh, that companies need to take a look at? Yeah, um, a good question, Rocco. Uh, I think one of the things that first comes to mind for me, uh, and I'm a, a big proponent of speaking on threat modeling, uh, with my work with uh, government entities, the working groups that I sit on with DHS and any of the uh, other types of um, seminars that I, I spend some time in, I oftentimes do focus on threat modeling because I feel like it is somewhat of a lost art in information security and information security programs and CISOs uh, by way of that. And so uh, over the last three months, so many of our companies haven't just transformed to work remote. We've added new products, new services. We've transitioned where we were doing work, maybe where we were storing information, where we were accessing information. We've opened up channels for our customers, our clients, our partners, third parties to be able to work with us remotely as well. We've done probably the most significant transformation of data accessibility um, in a short period of time than we ever have in our career. And so what I would challenge all of our, our uh, peers on this call on in this seminar today is to ask yourselves whether or not in this transformation, your information security groups have uh, up, you know, taken up the, the um, you know, recent review of looking at your threat models. You now have uh, maybe new ways of data being accessed, uh, new technologies that are being used as I've covered. Um, if you're familiar with threat modeling, it even comes out of NIST, NIST uh, standards, uh, 853 might talk about it, and some, then there's some uh, other parts that really get into details. But basically, your, your uh, security group should be looking at and evaluating threat modeling on an annual basis, and then whenever there's significant security you know, issues or significant changes in architecture. And, and doing so, what you're, you're aiming to do is look at what is the most important information that you have, you know, the keys to the kingdom. What do you have that you're trying to protect? Who do you think the attackers are that would be trying to get to that data? And what would be the attack profiles they would be using to get to that data? And so, you know, you might have um, financial information and you believe that the prime attackers that are looking to get that would be cyber criminals utilizing uh, attack profiles such as phishing, social engineering, malware. And then for each of those, you need to take the time to look at what is the likelihood and impact of those attacks and ensure finally that your controls around them are secure. Taking a, a kind of a turn towards what we have today, for those who have implemented additional remote access capabilities, you know, for those who have uh, um, implemented additional access controls that allow third parties or other entities to access environments, you know, have those controls been locked down to such a way that it is um, allowing and enabling your business, but managing the risk of security. And so, in short, I just repeat and say that uh, having a refocus on, on the threat modeling assessments and understanding your risks and the environment is something I highly recommend companies are doing uh, at this time based on all these changes. Great points, Mike. Thanks for uh, providing us, especially on the threat model and as we rattle off all these different things that companies should do. You're, 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 we're not hearing too many companies talk on the threat model and the more mature ones ahead of the curve are in. You pointed one in your, your last comment there about third party risk management and so forth. There's an organization called Shared Assessments that's been around for a while and put a framework together, coupled with innovation. And you know, we, we just helped I'll put out a white paper on IoT technology. So look at, you know, from what you're talking about on the threat modeling to third parties to innovation and technology. And so, Danchu, I know uh, that third party risk and compliance is um, you know, a, a real big hot spot for you. Um, but on the heels of what Michael just shared, um, what are your thoughts that companies should be doing, especially when you look at the third party risks in the middle of the pandemic, as well as governance and 
you can be sure there'll be a lot more compliance and regulatory measures that are going to be coming down the pike for sure. Yeah, sure, Rocco. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Um, you know, third parties are facing the same challenges we are as companies, right? They're you know, they're having the, you know they're they're facing COVID just like we are, and um, and when you have such a dependency on third parties, I mean, we we certainly do. And uh, one of the things that you know they're coming to the same they're coming to those same conclusions about you know they can't work, they have to work from home you have to worry about things like connectivity. Uh, for us, we need to make sure that however they're working from home or wherever they're working from, that they're still working in a secure manner. So, so, it's, so it's forcing us to kind of re-examine those relationships and what happens when the workforce of a, of a third party is now working somewhere else. So everything from you know, how they're connecting into our systems, you know, what, what machines they're using, are they using company owned, are they using company issued machines, are they using you know, are they using personal devices? And you gotta kind of think of all those provisions. And with that said, you also need to take a, a look again at your, at, your at, the, at the contracts that you have with them. You know, what types of, you know, what are the legal implications if they start working differently and are, and are you adequately protected? So we've gone through and, um, and worked very closely with third parties and the relationship owners and um, really gotten a, a lot closer to how they actually work with us and making sure that that we're protected. The, the other thing it really, um, what it's given us insight into is just their own DR capabilities. You know, how quickly, you know, how quickly are, are our third parties able to shift and be able to, you know, really be able to support um, and really be able to support us. So especially when we start thinking about, you know, groups that are, you know, groups that are offshore where connectivity is an issue, you know, the, the hours that they work, um, you know, any, any, any number of things, but it's really, it, it's really forced us to take a really hard look at, you know, how we work with third parties. And I think in the future, it's also going to affect the way that we look at third parties when we assess them and also, um, and how we look at them from an ongoing monitoring perspective. Um, one thing I'll add is the other thing we're also seeing is just their dependency on their own third party. So really fourth parties for us, right? So, so they're all, you know, they're, they would also have concerns about their own third party. So it's kind of a chain reaction, but it's, um, but it's something that we need to be very mindful of because we are so dependent on them. No doubt, you can uh, outsource the function, but you know who yeah. owns the risk when that third party is uh, driving at the wheel with your function, no, your data, or whatever it may be. Yeah, that's a great point because yeah, they do. Yeah, you, you, you're you're still ultimately responsible because they're working on your behalf. So you know, you still have you know legal obligations associated with any kind of consumer data. You know, you know, anything that they really access, you're still, you know, you're still responsible as a company, so you really need to be mindful of that. Sure. And, you know, as much as we've spoken about, you know, all the things that could happen, all the things that are happening, you know, it, some of the other panelists from the previous sessions were talking about uh, digital transformation, innovation, and embracing it. And, you know, I, I, you've had companies that have jumped into the cloud five plus years ago, some not so fast. I think we're going to see everyone's hand pushed. And if you haven't, you better jump in. Or if you haven't been left behind already, you're going to be left in fast, uh, even uh, faster. You know, to that end, Costas, I know you and your team and partners around the world have worked in a lot of different um, business transformation, innovations, and so forth. In the midst of COVID, without you know saying the obvious, as we continue moving forward, I almost don't want to use the word post-COVID because just as you think we're turning the corner, you know, setback here or there if we see what's going on around the country. But from your perspective, Costas, it's not just, you know, from a national standpoint globally, what are some of the digital transformation measures that companies are going to be tackling as we move forward? Yeah, thanks, Rocco. I, I think uh, to the comment that you made for companies that have really invested in digital transformation, uh, and really have looked at the cloud as an enabler, uh, not only for uh, their business, but their consumers, customers, uh, for example, are significantly ahead uh, in addressing some of the challenges I think we're experiencing uh, today uh, in the COVID environment. Uh, for us, uh, you know, I started a program uh, five years ago to aggressively move uh, into the cloud. And one of our last enterprise security capabilities was actually migrated on March 9th in, in the middle uh, of uh, the announcements of companies sending their employees home. Um, and thankfully uh, for us, that was the last bit 
of uh, security capability that was in the traditional data center today. Um, and I've spoken to many of my colleagues and I'd love to hear from uh, the panelists themselves. Our entire security stack is in the cloud and it has given us unparalleled flexibility in scaling up solutions or bringing online uh, new capabilities that we don't have to depend on personnel that have to visit the data center or uh, resources uh, that are not available due to restrictions, whether they're travel uh, or otherwise. And I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that we've seen on a global scale, as the world has seen different variations of lockdowns and restrictions, uh, the ability for people uh, to physically be able to go into the office has been significantly impacted aside from the fact uh, that we have this pandemic and people are now considering how do we get back in some limited form into the office. So virtualization uh, for us has been a key enabler, something that we saw again or earlier uh, in the year as uh, our experience in China clearly demonstrated that we had to be agile and we had to provide operational continuity uh, to the organization, including customers um, and employees, uh, as well as third parties, um, and our ability to quickly, in the cloud, spin up virtualized uh, environments has been a, a significant enabler. And even from a security perspective, when you think about malware, uh, for example, uh, you know, it's one thing to be able to isolate and contain it, uh, which I'm sure everyone here is, is doing well. It's another thing when you do that and the employee now has no ability to continue to work. Uh, so you start impacting your productivity, you start impacting your operations, you multiply that over time. Uh, we're now into a three month cycle uh, of COVID and you can quickly see how that can scale up and be a significant outage for you, your suppliers uh, and the employees. And, and lastly, the supply chain. Um, I think for us, particularly uh, we're a vast company, uh, again, in many, many different markets around the world seeing the attacks that are emanating in the supply chain are a, a significant concern and something that we've been addressing uh, with tabletops prior uh, to COVID, but, but really the learnings and the ability to reapply that now uh, in our organization has been uh, really, uh, I think, a competitive advantage for us. So we're prepared uh, for the outage. We have resiliency implemented in our solutions and we're working uh, with our third party suppliers. So if they go down and their systems are not accessible, we at least have virtualization capacity and capability to allow them to continue to support our operations remotely. Fantastic, great points, Gossis. Thanks for that. You know, I, I know Mike, we, we were talking about, um, you know, business continuity, technologies and so forth. And even at the beginning, I had mentioned resiliency. Uh, Costas, to your point, it's you never you know, doing the tabletops. We're never going to have the crystal ball, but at the same time, um, while we can't predict the future, um, some contingency planning. You mentioned resiliency a couple times. Um, Want to throw back to you on that point, Mike. Um, in terms of you know, while we've got the business continuity, we're looking at traditional resiliency measures. What kind of technology? What kind of innovations? especially what I connected as should businesses be looking at moving forward? Oh, no, again, that's a challenging question. Thank you for uh, giving me the challenging one, Ronco. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I mean, with the panelists we have there, you guys just sure, really sure. overlap nicely together. So, you know, Casas uh, effectively really communicated the benefits of not just, um, not just looking at the cloud as an option, but, uh, I connect of much like Procter and Gamble, you know, had put a fully fledged formal program together. I don't know if Casas, if you call it a cloud first strategy when you first started it or not. Correct. But, yeah. You know, yeah. But having a program in place that looks at you know new products and services, and in addition to migrating over previously existing products and services that may have been on-prem solutions. And so, um, I I have seen a lot of my peers that have accelerated. Uh, you know, those efforts in the last three months, last three or four months, they've accomplished what uh, a plan would have taken them, you know, nine to 18 months to do. And, you know, they've effectively been able to accelerate those efforts. And so I agree wholeheartedly with Casas how, how important those transitions can be, especially if it's already in the business goals and objectives to move on them and not delay in them. Because um, while I would, I would stress that 
and Costas, you could back me up on this, that the in-year cost of moving to the cloud, um, surprisingly, will probably not save every company what you think it will save compared to an on-prem environment. If you still have space, if you still have virtual machine, uh, you know, space and, and hardware, software solutions, all that stuff in your prem, on-prem solution, you know, expanding to the cloud and having to build out a security suite, the logging, the monitoring, the capturing, all of that in addition to whether you're going with uh, AWS and Lambda or you're going a serverless architecture or a server architecture, depending on which environment you choose. Um, I think uh, most of my peers would say that you don't necessarily find in-year savings, but it's the beyond the in-year saving, it's the continued um, use to those environments, expanding, getting the capabilities of the other products and services that may be offered. You know, Google is just fabulous for their AI, machine learning capabilities. You know, Amazon is just well known for all of the other services you can take advantage of um, that will help uh, that you could integrate with your existing products. Um, so there's kind of characteristics that each provide, but I would, I would encourage um, many of our, our peers here to not defer if you um, already started down that path and potentially even look at accelerating because uh, as one of our previous panelists had mentioned, we don't, we don't think that uh, something like what we've gone through today in these last few months of the pandemic will be the last we've seen in our lifetime, right? And so uh, having environments where redundancy is already in place, continuity is in place, the ability to shift from regions or within region, um, you know, is really at a click of a button and those systems and services could be built there is really a huge benefit to global teams um, that normally have to manage data centers to do so. Yeah, Mike, well, and, uh, what I would add great point. As, as an insight there, uh, we actually saw about a 30% reduction in cost in, uh, in moving from the traditional data center into the cloud and what we ended up doing is taking that savings and reinvest it back in automation and building up uh, engineering talent. So for those of you who are on the call, um, going into the cloud sounds like a great idea. It is a great idea. I would encourage you as Michael did, but I would also tell you, you need to build your own engineering teams. Do not rely on a third party uh, to architect, build and design that uh, cloud environment for you and maintain that expertise in your own walls, that is going to be the competitive advantage for companies going forward. That's what gives us the ability uh, with speed and agility to change uh, a lot of our solutions without really relying on extensive third partners. We do have them in the ecosystem, but build your engineering team. You, you can thank me a year from now or two years from now on another call. For sure. Great points, guys. And you know, as much as we've we've spoken about the corporations, the innovation, you know, Sudanshu and you know, all of you for that matter, looking at, you know, the end user, the the individuals, the customers, um, with everything, you know, going on, uh Sudanshu, we've talked about, you know, the employees being the Achilles heel, but flip it back to our end customers. You know, I, I know we're coming coming up on the time, so but to that end, uh, Sudanshu, if you could give us a little insight on the individual users, what what have you been doing in the wake of that? Yeah, so uh, you know, with the, with the new with the new normal, um, it's just it's more important than ever that you know that we maintain our end user training, especially when it comes to security. So things, so we had very um, you know kind of targeted content that that we provided to our our employees and contractors around things like phishing scams and you know, we saw we saw a resurgence of those with, uh, after COVID started so um, employees were getting targeted with coronavirus related scams about you know maps and statuses and that sort of thing but then we've also looked at um, with the new arrangements they're working from home so now the home security network is even more important so we're giving them you know we, we provide some education around the you know, best practices for you know, their Wi-Fi security, uh, you know, not mixing your your personal and your work devices and, you know, trying to keep them really separate. Even things like um, if you have documents that are confidential in nature that you don't, you're not throwing away with the regular trash, you know, we're trying to just keep them aware and, and keep that content really um, kind of all, always going on uh, on our kind of internal websites. But then also, as you know, with Comcast, we have, we have employees all over the place, you know, not just at HQ, but then, you know, in the field and other locations, so we're using all of our communication channels, really working with our communications teams to, to really get that word out and make, it, and make sure that you know, they're constantly getting messaged with, with just being, you know, what they can do to be secure for, not just to protect themselves for work, but really to protect themselves in general. 
And to that end, we've also started you know, putting out content for our consumers about how they, how they can protect themselves again for, um, in this new time. Great. Fantastic, Sudanshu. I know Hunter's uh, waving me on there. Um, wealth of uh, experience and expertise leadership. Just wanted to thank uh, Michael, Sudanshu, and Costas again for putting this great presentation together and making time to, out of your busy schedule to join us today. Hunter, over to you. Thanks again for having me. Excellent, Rocco. Thank you, gentlemen. Awesome job. Really appreciate your engagement. Love to have you thank back. You, in the, at a future, love to have you back at a future time. Thank you. And that's a wrap up. Another uh, world class summit here at HMG Live. Uh, thanks so much for all the active engagement. Big thanks and shout out to Gary Sorrentino and the folks over at Zoom uh, for being a great national partner. A big shout out to uh, Larry and the Philadelphia Sim chapter. Check uh, Philadelphia Sim out. It's a great organization. And thanks again to all of our speakers, uh, our panelists, for a great program. Uh, please uh, spread the word. We're, we'll literally be here back here tomorrow uh, with the Financial Services Summit in New York. And then Thursday is the uh, Innovation Summit from uh, Silicon Valley. Take care and uh, be safe.